downstairs room, middle room. Fab, okay, so uh, today we celebrate the Reformation, all right, and we celebrate what happened through Martin Luther. Some of you probably came to church thinking, I never realized that that guy who fought for black rights lived 500 years ago. If you came, you're, you're confusing with Martin Luther King, all right, I don't know if you, you still get it. I used to when I was younger, so it was a Martin Luther King, 20th century guy, black American who fought for... Uh, the rights of uh, blacks in America. This is Martin Luther, 500 years ago. 1517 uh, was the year when it all kind of kicked off. It all started where it, he'd been saved, okay? This is a, a guy who was a monk and tried and tried and tried really, really hard to please God. And he knew he was failing all the time and he was killing him. He felt like he was in chains to this, the law. He was trying to keep and he couldn't keep it until he's looking at scripture and suddenly like, it hits him between the eyes, reading Romans. And it's like the righteous will live by faith. Something that's given, it just socked him. It's like, oh, I don't have to try. I don't have to try and be good enough. God just gives it. And he just said basically to God, God, give it to me. I need it, I want it. And God changed him like that. And the scales came off his eyes, and he realized that, man, I've got to start doing something in, in Europe. I've got, to, I've got to change things. The church at the moment is shocking, which it was at the time. The Catholic church, which is kind of the ruling church, was shocking. They were going around asking people for money uh, so that their dead relatives could get forgiveness of sins and go from purgatory to heaven doing awful, shocking things like that. They were making stuff up. And people didn't have the Bibles, so they could say whatever they wanted, really, and get away with it. And, but one of the things, the main thing that Luther found is like, I don't have to try and earn my way to heaven. I can't earn my way to heaven. It's grace. It's given. And when he got that, and he realized the freedom in that, man, he, um, he, he was ready to take on the world. And he pretty much took on the world. And some of you will know the story of when he, in, in 1521, um, he's, he's, he's brought uh, to a, a meeting where Charles the V, I think, was kind of the emperor at the time. Uh, you'll have to look that up, I'm not, not sure. And loads of the princes of all the regions and Germany and, uh, and other areas and all the, the bishops and the cardinals and so on, they're all there. And they're all like hundreds of them saying to this little guy, Martin Luther, you take it back, son. Everything you said, everything that you're preaching, you're spreading, you've got to recant. Take it back. Say, oh, I didn't mean it. And uh, in front of, it's seemingly like the whole of the church, the whole of Europe, all the laws that be, he says, no, I, here I stand. I can't do anything else. I can't do, I can do no other. So help me God. And it took a man like that to just revolutionize the, the church in Europe. And the church rediscovered the amazing truth of the gospel that had been mostly hidden. Not completely, because they were obviously true believers around, true Christians. Uh, but Martin Luther did something incredible. We can't say this morning that this church is here, that you were saved if you're a Christian this morning because of Martin Luther. But we do know that that man standing for Jesus and for the scriptures made a massive difference right across Europe, which has resonated throughout the centuries. So we, we owe that man a debt. But essentially, we're celebrating 500 years, which is fantastic, which is why we got balloons, which are kind of going down. And uh, I went, went into the shop yesterday to, to buy these balloons, and this, this older lady was like, so when are you having this, this do? I said, tomorrow. She said, oh, not gonna last. And uh, they said they last for 10 hours. Ah, I said, okay. Don't matter, I'll have them anyway. They're not going to last, though. Yeah, but, um, yeah, I just, I need to get, we'll, we'll take a risk. Yeah, but I'm telling you, they're going to go down in 10 hours, okay? And I said, like, oh, it's okay, I'm not going to come back to the shop. And, uh, but she was a real kind of um, battle axe, is that the right phrase? I don't know, but uh, not, not got the best people skills. And then when she gave me these 10 balloons, which are obviously filled with helium and, and you know, kind of go up in the air, She's like, be careful now you don't lose any, whatever, as you go in. And I was like, I'm not going to take off now, am I? Kind of like trying to lighten the mood. And she goes, no. <laughs> so that was, yeah. 
Anyway, that's an aside. But uh, so that's why we've got balloons and bunting and uh, drink, because we need to celebrate these amazing things that happen in history. Learn from them and be inspired by them. But we're in the, the book of Romans, okay, which is fitting for Reformation uh, celebration. Reformation Day is the 31st of October, which is Tuesday. This is the closest Sunday. Um, but yeah, a huge book that influenced Martin Luther. We're in chapter three. The book of Romans is all about grace how you come into grace, how you live as a result of grace, unifying in grace, and then practical considerations as a result of grace. It's all about grace. But for the first three chapters, what Paul is writing to the Romans, he's, he's kind of explaining the gospel, yeah? And he's sort of saying, this is what you need to grasp in order to get to Jesus. And so he's really kind of nailing home sin. The fact that Everybody in the world is a sinner. And so he, he kind of starts in, um, in chapter, two with, uh, chapter one with uh, everybody, even the people who say, well, I, I'm not, I don't care about religion or whatever, I don't even try. He's like, but yeah, God is still going to judge you. And then he goes through to the people who are kind of moral, but they're not Jews. And he's like, yeah, you're, you're, you're sinners as well. And then he... He talks about the Jews, he, he attacks the Jewish people and says, you know, you've got the law, that's not going to save you. The last time we were in chapter 3, verse 1, and, and we saw then that even though they had the privilege of the law, uh, he was answering all these questions of, of the, the Jews that they were throwing at him, I guess. But now this morning we get to verse 9. So we're going to go from verse 9 through to 22, Okay. Now, this is almost, this is going to be a bit of a shock uh, this morning for some of you, maybe, if you've come to church wanting um, it all to be kind of flowers and, and all pretty stuff or whatever and all uplifting stuff. This is going to shock you a little bit, all right? It's like so far, he's trying to like nail people, trying to drive home, you're all a sinners. It's almost like he gets out the real big guns here, all the artillery, and he comes out firing from all angles to finally try and get it across that you need Jesus. So it's, it's pretty brutal, but it's brutally honest. Verse 9, he says, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? He's talking about the Jewish people. Do we have any advantage not at all. Now, you may remember, you probably don't, but a couple of weeks ago when we looked at uh, verse 1, uh, so look at verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, what advantage then is there being a Jew? Or what value is there in being circumcised? And the answer, much in every way. Uh, because they've been entrusted with the words of God. Then we, we get to verse 9, just a few sentences later, and he says, what should we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? No, not at all. Now, what's gone on there? How do we understand Paul uh, saying seemingly two contradictory things? Well, one thing we've got to realize is that uh, it's really important that you don't take Scripture out of context. That's what people do, isn't it? They take an individual verse, and they can, you can make something on its own, say pretty much whatever you want. So if you really want to be honest to Scripture and find out what God really is saying, you've got to look at the context, the verses around the book that the verses are contained in, and then the books of the Bible that that book is part of. You've got to look at the whole context to really get what God is saying. And so when you look at verse 1, for instance, um, and he says, what advantage is in there being a Jew or being circumcised? He says, lots, when you consider that you've been blessed with the words of God. You've been entrusted with the word of God. That's an amazing privilege. That's a blessing, okay? But he's saying it from a different angle now. So have we any advantage? Now listen to what he says. Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. So he's talking now from the, the aspect of, okay, so uh, is there any advantage, is there any kind of hierarchy um, for the Jew as opposed to the Gentile, the non-Jew, before God? They're obviously blessed people because they've been given the privilege of the law and the truth and the promises, but does that make them any better than anybody else? No, not at all. 
That's what Paul is saying. And his reason is because we're all exactly the same. We're all sinners. That's the kind of thing that flattens it all out for everybody. We're all exactly the same. As an aside, um, there are two main reasons why racism is wrong. One reason why racism is wrong is that we're all made in the image of God. And so we all have the same dignity before God. Adam was created in God's image. We all descend from Adam. So irrespective of color or ethnicity, we are all equal before God. It's one reason why racism is so very wrong. A second reason why racism is so very wrong is that actually we're all sinners as well. And that kind of flattens us all out. And whilst we may look at other people and say, okay, there are kind of degrees of sin, and some people, in an outward sense, do some really bad things, and some people don't do such bad things, and God will reflect that in his judgment because he is just. Ultimately, though, internally, we're all sinners. And that makes us all ultimately the same. We're all sinners. So we can't in any way or in any area of life elevate ourselves and think we are better than anybody else. That just isn't an option for you and I. Verse 18 then comes, uh, not verse 18, verses 10 to 18. Now what Paul does here is he goes to the Old Testament and he's like, right, I'm going to prove this to you now, guys. You people who think that I'm a, a new person who's got this new religion, let me quote to you from the Old Testament. Let me show you what God says. And so he goes back to Ecclesiastes. He goes back particularly to Psalm 14, and then 53, and 140, and 10, and 36, and Isaiah 59. He just he, he quotes and alludes to loads of Old Testament passages to really bring home that God has always said in the Bible that we are sinners. This is where it becomes brutal. Listen to this now. So this is verse 10. We read verses 10 to 12 now. I'm going to see if you can spot a, a recurring word or phrase. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. You spotting the recurring words and phrases there? The, the phrase no one or uh, not even one is used six times. And then from the, the other point of view, all have turned away and together become. It's like this all-encompassing phraseology that Paul is using to basically say, this is everyone now, guys. So he starts off, there is no one righteous, not even one. So you can't go through the entire uh, world, or you can go through the entire world rather, and you go to every single person. You can spend um, a year with every single person, and you will find out that they are not righteous. You'll find that out. Whether they be a pope, or whether they be Mother Teresa, or whether they be Martin Luther King, or Martin Luther, or whoever it is, whatever they look like, whatever job they have, whether they're teachers, whether they're lawyers, especially if they're lawyers. No, I'm joking. That's just, uh, that's just what I don't know why they say that. Um, I, traffic wardens, I would get, but I, lie, I don't know. Anyway, moving on, but we're all, you won't find anybody in this entire universe that is any different. We are all sinners. Not one person is righteous. Don't be fooled, guys, by smiling faces. Don't be fooled, guys, by posh robes. Whilst there are nice people, Every single person in this entire universe is a sinner. Not one person is righteous. Not one person good enough for heaven. He says, verse 11, there's no one that understands. No one understands. Now, this is um, a hard one to get your head around sometimes because like, people are intelligent, aren't they? Get like an Einstein or someone like a Stephen Hawking who is more more clear now in his, his seeming disbelief of a creator. And he seems to be the most intelligent person in the, in the universe at the moment. Uh, and you get other people, and you know there's lots of really intelligent people 
who don't believe in God, as there are lots of intelligent people who do believe in God. But this verse here is saying, actually, there's nobody that gets it. Not one person without the help of God understands. So it's not so much an intelligent thing. What he's saying is, you know, in terms of like who God is, nobody gets it. Nobody understands naturally how holy he is, how pure he is, how majestic he is, how powerful he is. Nobody gets that. Nobody can. They try and think it through and they come up with their own ideas and generally they create a God in their own image and it's bound up with the kind of sinful ideas of what God is like. No one really understands themselves either. You find that when you talk to people and you try and kind of like, do you understand your sin? I don't, I don't see that. I don't get that. We don't understand. Naturally, we can't understand the, what we are like. We can't understand the need for Jesus. It's just not something that naturally we get. It's not an intelligence thing. But all of us, because of sin, can't understand anything about God, about life, about how it all works. Uh, he says there's no one, second part of verse 11, who seeks God. No one who seeks God. All turn away, he carries on and says. We, we don't even like want to go for God. You know, sometimes you can say to people, listen, the, the Bible says, if you seek me, you will find me. If you search for me with all your heart. And people say, I've done that. I've tried that. And like, oh, what are you done? You like prayed for like two minutes or something? It's like our natural inclination isn't to like run after God and to want God. Our natural inclination is to go after anything, to seek anything else other than God. Nobody seeks God, the Bible says. All have turned away and together they've become worthless. Now that's the shocking phrase, isn't it? I just remind you now, this isn't me having a bad day. This isn't me being grumpy. This is me telling you what the Bible is saying, okay? Every one of you here, everyone in the world, become worthless. Created in the image of God with amazing dignity, incredible value, amazing uh, individuals before God. And still there's that value there in one sense, but because of sin, we've become worthless. So God looks at us and like you've made yourself worthless. It's like you, you take a, um, a really expensive work of art, a masterpiece, like a Mona Lisa or something. Imagine that you buy that. It costs you 50 million pounds, for instance, if you're able to buy it from the Louvre. And so you've got this in your house now. You've got the Mona Lisa. But then like you decide one day, you get the Sharpie out, you draw on the kind of moustache and the beard and the glasses and so on. You change, you give it an afro and, and you start to just doodle all over it because you think that'll be fun. And you start to kind of ruin this picture. And then you start to just splotch paint on it. And you don't put it up on the wall, it's on the floor. So you're like walking all over it and you're, you're breaking the kind of the canvas and it's all out of shape and now it's covered in mud and dirt and it's scraped. And then the cat uh, likes to go on it, likes to scratch on it. So the cat has scratched this to pieces. And it's just, it's a real mess. You go out one day, you come home drunk, you urinate all over this masterpiece that's on the floor. And so you've got something here that was worth 50 million pounds. It's like incredible value. Uh, but you've taken it, you've just abused it. You've completely messed it up. You've made it something ugly. You've made it something disgusting, dirty, vile, smelly, and worthless. That's you and me. That's what the Bible is saying. That's what we do with how God has made us. We become worthless. And then he just says again, there is no one who does good, not even one. And so if any of us uh, have it in our minds that I can, I can do good, I can do enough good to get to heaven, this is what it's saying here, it's saying no, you can't. You cannot do any good. Everything you think, everything you do, even your motives, they're tinged with, spoiled with, marred by sin. You 
can't do anything good. Get that out of your head. So Paul is saying here. You know, even as, as believers, it's really important that we remember that um, as we go on in our Christian lives, we're still totally dependent on God for everything. Once we start thinking, I'll do it my way, we'll just stick sin in it. We will. We need, because that's what Jesus said, you can't do anything without me. You can't. You need, I need constantly to be saying, God, you fill me. You work in me. Anything good that I can ever do, anything where I can understand you, anything where I start to seek after you, all of that only comes when God is in us. It all comes from God. It can't come from anywhere else. It certainly can't come from you and I. So dependent on Jesus, guys. All right. He gets graphic now. He wants to make it a little bit vivid to drive this home. And so he uses three kind of body parts to illustrate sin. It's kind of the uh, body parts, I guess, where sin is most clearly seen. So in verses 12 and 14, or sorry, 13 to 14 rather, he talks about the mouth or the throat or the tongue. In uh, verse 15, he talks about the feet. And, And then in verse 18, he mentions the eyes. Okay, so first of all, uh, verse 13, let's read 13, 14. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. That's, that's an incredible description, isn't it, of, of what we're like with, with our tongues and with our mouths, open graves, not empty graves, just open graves. It's like the throats um, are like these things that just devour people with these poisonous tongues that we have, the things that we say about people. I don't know if you noticed that or find that about yourself. Uh, It's amazing. When I was reading this this week and just thinking about my throat, my mouth being like an open grave, and then catching myself talking about people, and almost running them down, just so quickly wanting to destroy people, thinking, man, that's right. My throat is like an open grave. Just want to destroy people all the time with my tongue. The next uh, verse, verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. In other words, our, in our actions and in our reactions, we are so quick to run headlong into sin. I don't know if you notice that when somebody riles you or winds you up or hurts you or whatever, how quickly you want to get them back, how quickly you want to just run headlong after them to do something to sort that out. And... Uh, I kind of, I've, I've tried to tell many people over the years, myself included, don't act straight away. It's really important. If something happens, somebody hurts you, please don't act that day or even the next day. Just let it all settle because we will be quick to do the wrong thing and to rush into some kind of sinful action. We'll be quick to run to revenge, to anger, to lust, to pride. And then finally, in verse 18, There is no fear of God before their eyes. In other words, when when we're going about our day and we're we're seeing what's ahead of us and when we're thinking in in our mind's eye, what what do we see? What do we see before us? This verse here is saying what we don't see is a fear of God. You won't get that with people. You won't get that with us naturally without Jesus' help. That sense of God is there and he's holy and I want to fear him and I want to do the right thing. That's just not there in the natural for us. No fear of God. What we see is opportunities to envy, to boast, to lust, to attack and to deceive. 
That's what we see. I'm, I'm reminded of, of when I became a Christian, and, and th- this is what you need, okay? If you're not a Christian yet this morning, this is what you need. You need God to speak to you. You're in desperate need for God to speak to you because you, like me, cannot understand, do not seek after God. You're not going to ever get it until God speaks to you. I was going merrily believing in God and imagining he existed, uh, but thinking I was going to be good enough for heaven. Didn't see any of this. It wasn't that I was thick or unintelligent. I didn't see it until God started working and started showing me, and I could see then my sin. And I realized then if I was a sinner, and I realized that my sin was bad, and it wasn't going to be good enough anymore to get me into heaven, I could see that it had to be Jesus. Had to be Jesus, nobody else. And I was just attracted to, drawn to, powerfully brought to Jesus as the only answer until I said, Jesus, I want you. I said yes to Jesus, and he changed my life. That's what you need, guys. So if you don't see it, if you don't feel it, if you don't know it, if you don't understand it, if you don't feel yourself seeking God, I, I, w- I would say to you, start crying out to God. And I, I really do believe it is true that if you seek the Lord with all your heart, you will find him. But it has to be all your heart. I don't get it. I really don't. When uh, people will say, yeah, I tried that. I've done that. And they've done it for a little while. They've prayed a few prayers, whatever it is. I, I just, I don't get it. I just think, if there's the possibility that there's a God, if there's a possibility that there's a heaven and there's a hell, and if there's a possibility that what I've heard a preacher say once is true, then why don't people just, I'm not letting this go. I have to, I have to. I think of Leo Leo Tolstoy, who in his life just thought, I've got to find the meaning of life, and he tried it everywhere. He went absolutely everywhere looking for what is life all about. And it failed him, it failed him with women, it failed him with money, it failed him with success and fame until he found Jesus and then he thought, this is it. And he found life in Jesus. I just don't get it, guys. If you were here this morning, I don't get it. And you really don't care that much. Or you almost say, well, if, if there's a God, he's got to reveal himself to me. I would say to you, you've got to seek him. You've got to be crying out to him saying, God, if what Neil is saying this morning is true, show me. Show me. I need to see it. This is really important because he's talking about the fact that I'm a sinner and I'm going to go to hell without Jesus. This is really important. Is that true, God? Show me. You can't let that go, can you? You can't just walk out and think, this is not important. I'm going to get on my life now. I'm just going to get a job. I'm going to get a new Xbox, whatever it is. It's not important, is it? Cannot be any more important than you getting right with God. Got to seek God, guys. Got to seek God. And so, while well, Paul gets to the end of this, this section now, hopefully with his readership and hopefully here this morning, nailing it really to say, listen, you need Jesus. Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. What he's saying there is, uh, particularly to the Jewish people of the day, uh, because the law was everything to them, and they thought that the law was given so that we could try and keep it in order to earn our way to heaven. He's saying, no, 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 no. Can you not see now? The law was never given as your method for getting to heaven. If anything, the main purpose of the law was to show you that you needed help that you needed Jesus. It condemns us, the law does. doesn't raise us up to heaven. But verse 21, verse 21. But now, apart from the law, apart from trying to be good enough, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify, the Old Testament testifies. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. It's given. That's it. It's given. 
So if you and I want to be righteous, right, good before God, we can get the righteousness of God, the perfection of God himself, we just get given it. That was it. When Martin Luther got this, when the penny dropped, oh man, it completely changed his life. And it set in motion this incredible movement throughout Europe, which, which just changed everything. It's like, I don't have to try and do good works in order to get to heaven. I get to heaven because God has just said, I'm making you righteous now because of Jesus. Fantastic, I'm free. I'm free from the law. I don't have to try and keep it any longer. So what are good works for? Good works are now for just showing how amazing God is. Good works are now for me just to like live in them because they're fantastic. Good works now are for me to bless other people. So there was an incredible movement through Christianity, true Christianity, because of the Reformation. So um, as a result of the Reformation came amazing waves of social improvement. Uh, abolition of slavery, improved rights for workers, improved conditions and in institutions, orphanages, food and housing for the poor and so on. And they were just enlarged, driven by Christianity and by this revelation that God actually loves us through Jesus. And now to reflect how amazing he is and how good he is, we just want to love other people. Martin Luther, and we'll finish with this now. Martin Luther wrote this little booklet after he was converted and he called it The Freedom of the Christian. And in it, he gave a kind of a, an illustration, a metaphor, if you will, to describe um, what God does, the gospel. Hopefully this will show you this morning how amazing the gospel is and show you how simple it is and show you that God is just ready right now to do something incredible for you and give you salvation, righteousness, make you ready for heaven, free you from all the law, all condemnation, all guilt, come into your life and love you for the rest of forever. So this is the illustration that Martin Luther gave. He, he told the story of a king who married a prostitute. And in this illustration, the king was representative of Jesus and the prostitute representative of you and I. So uh, this girl could never have made herself a queen. Uh, she just didn't have it about her. She didn't have the right background, the right upbringing. She didn't have the right... Um, bloodline or behavior but the king sought out this girl and he proposed to her and he set his love on her she says yes and he makes his vows then to this girl and he makes her his own promising to love her and to be faithful to her forever in doing so he bears all her debts and he shares his boundless wealth with her. She didn't earn it. She didn't achieve it by acting like a queen. And even uh, when she became queen, she didn't immediately change and act in a royal way. She, she still couldn't. Although day by day, she did change uh, to become more like the person she now knew she was. But when the king made his eternal promise to her, he changed her status. So for all her dark and debauched ways, that former prostitute became a queen. That's kind of what God does for us. He takes us, we said this morning that we are sinners and that we don't deserve anything from God. No matter what we try to do to, to look the part, to look like a Christian or whatever we think, like Martin Luther going to a monastery and trying his hardest, we cannot. But what God says to you, but I will make you, I will make you. I got an offer for you this morning. That's what he says, I got an offer for you. I want you to be mine forever. All your debt, everything you've ever done wrong, I, I'll, I'm taking that off you. Because my son actually paid that debt on the cross for you. That's how amazing it is. That's how much he loves you. I'll take that. I'll, get, I'll take that off you right now. Instead, I'll just give you all my riches. I'll give it all to you. And I come into your life. I'm going to be your father. I'm going to be your friend. And the inheritance that is Jesus's, you're going to get. 
and I'm going to be faithful to you. And I know that for the rest of your life on earth, you're not going to be perfect. In fact, every day, I know you're going to struggle to be like my son, Jesus. You're going to fail every day. Doesn't matter because I'm choosing to love you. And I'm choosing to be faithful to you every single day. And so I'll never leave you. And I'll never let you go. And I'll never let you down. Will you say yes to that? Will you say less to that amazing offer of God for you? He's done it all. So you don't have to do anything. And you just say, yes, Lord, I want that. I want that. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I appreciate that this was um, in some ways a uh, uh, a serious, somber message almost this morning, God, uh, because it just highlights a truth, but it's a hard truth to, uh, to take on board, God. And none of us like to hear it, but we like to pretend it's not true. Uh, but, but it is true, God, that we are sinners. What's amazing, though, Father, is that you made a way. And you made a way by sending Jesus, who died for me on the cross, and took all my sin so that I could be forgiven, so that you could bring me into a relationship with you because of him. Oh, Lord, I just, I want to ask you this morning, please will you, by your spirit, show people who are not yet saved that they need Jesus this morning. Show them, God, like you showed Martin Luther, like you've shown countless others, like you showed me, like you've shown... Many others in the congregation here this morning, show them, God. Only you can do that. I can't, God. I can shout till kingdom come. Only you can do that. Please, will you show them, Father, that they need you and show them how amazing Jesus is by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.